So Theodore of Mopsuestia, he was the Bishop of Mopsuestia, that was in Asia Minor. Um, I had to say the word Mopsuestia a lot when I was doing my dissertation. Um, my mother ended up abbreviating Theodore of Mopsuestia as Ted the Mop. So, a neighbor of Mac the Knife, I assume. So uh, he may have been the friend to whom Chrysostom wrote his exhortation to Theodore after his fall. Um, this is uh, a letter, sort of an open letter that, the that Chrysostom wrote to a friend named Theodore who had been intending to enter the priesthood and then decided to go to the secular life instead. And uh, John wrote to recall him to his original intention. And that may have been the same Theodore. Good chance of it. The dates are right. So McGuckin says, there is rarely any explicit doctrinal application in Theodore's exegesis. Most of his writings become, as a result, an extended paraphrase of the biblical story. He especially wishes to root out the Origenian habit of cross-relating texts from different scriptural books. We saw that um, just in the last origin example. And regularly fights against number symbolism, denying that it has any mystical associations whatsoever. Theodore retains the Alexandrian sense of typology as underlying some passages of the Bible, but massively reduces the scope and in intent of the types as compared to the Alexandrians. His chief legitimate types are Jonah as a symbolic foretelling of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Exodus as a type of the Passover of Christ, and the bronze serpent as a symbol of the passion. And what do all three of those have in common? They're biblical. They're biblical, and yeah. not just biblical, they're in the Gospels. Like, yeah. Jesus explicitly says one and three, and he sets up the Lord's Supper on the Passover for two. And then St. Paul talks about also the Red Sea um, as, as a type of baptism. So, uh, yeah, he is uh, sticking with what the New Testament expressly says about Old Testament types. Modern commentators have often quite wrongly <laughs> hailed him as a precursor of modern historical, critical, biblical interpretation, McGuckin says. And yeah, he's, he, uh, he doesn't share any of the uh, skeptical modern mindset of the historical, critical uh, interpreters. But what about the historical, grammatical interpreters, um, the people who accept uh, divine revelation and don't, and don't worry about uh, Q and different source theories, um, but just what is the Holy Spirit telling us and we're going to find out by reconstructing the history and studying the grammar. Never mind allegory. Theodore is a pretty good precursor for that kind of interpretation. Or he could be a precursor for that kind of interpretation if you could actually draw lines of influence from him to the modern world. And that makes him interesting, right? Because once, you, once you've read a lot of patristic exegesis, uh, you, you get used to the kind of things we were just looking at, and then you read Theodore, and it's not there. And uh, so he really stands out. The Antiochene's aim was to define the senses of scripture more precisely. The literal sense, according to them, covered the whole meaning of the writer, including his metaphors and figures. This is a point where Theodore would agree with the... Um, historical, literal, I mean, historical, grammatical interpretation of scripture today, right? Where we say that, um, sure, that's a metaphor. Sure, that's a figure of speech. God doesn't literally have, you know, hands or a face that you can go out from. But that's just part of the literal sense, right? That's just a trick of language, a figure of speech by which the literal sense is propounded. So that's something that the Antiochians also said back, you know, in the fourth and fifth century. Theodore's established custom of reading the text literally and sequentially makes his commentary on John one of the least inspiring versions of that gospel in patristic literature, <laughs> says McGuckin. You know, it, it's boring. He's just rephrasing things. But on the other hand, he also says John Chrysostom and Theodore are probably the best of the ancient commentators on Paul. You know, there are advantages to this kind of... Uh, to this kind of just trying to figure out what scripture is saying at the literal level and relating it to other things it says on a literal level and trying to get uh, a timeline. And this is what I did for my dissertation. You know, I, since Theodore was mainly an interpreter of scripture, I started with Genesis, uh, the fragments that we have from Theodore on Genesis. They're just fragments, but there's some really interesting fragments. And um, you know, this is his understanding of the Old Testament 
how God dealt with the Gentiles and how God dealt with the Jews in the Old Testament. And then um, this is his understanding of Christ. And you know, so the question of his Nestorianism is covered uh, in passing there, or more than in passing, but it's um, basically going in scriptural order, Old Testament through Christ, through the, uh, the, the time of the church. And um, because he does interpret the scripture that way, literally and sequentially, he is able to see some things that other interpreters didn't see as easily. Like his, his interpretation of the book of Galatians in particular, we'll be looking at some of that in a little bit, is, is really quite good. Like in, in places I felt like I was reading a Lutheran interpreter. You know, and until, until you get to the very end and he says, well, of course you can't preach it like this or nobody would do good works. <laughs> um, but he understands it in a, in a very Lutheran way. Um, like this is what Paul means. And a lot of that ability to understand Paul in that sense comes from having organized things literally and historically the way he has so that he can appreciate the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament and understand some of Paul's points better than somebody who's just seeing the whole Bible as the Logos talking to us. Which it also is. So Theodore's criticism of allegory, and this comes from his commentary on Galatians because Galatians chapter four is where St. Paul makes an allegory, right? The allegory of Hagar and Sarah. Um, in in uh, Galatians four, um, Saul says that uh, Hagar, because she's Egyptian, stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia, and Sarah, um, because she's the wife of Abraham, stands for Mount Zion. And so you have um, the Jerusalem that is below, which is like Hagar and her son Ishmael, a slave, cast out the son of the slave woman, for the, or cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave will not inherit with the son of the free man. Um, so Hagar in this allegory and Ishmael stand for the law and Sarah and Isaac stand for the promise. And this makes sense because Sarah, uh, Isaac was born by the promise entirely. Like Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 91 or something like that when Isaac was born. Isaac was born only by the promise of God and not by nature. And this is something Theodore explains very well in his Galatians commentary. That's why Isaac stands for this. He is the son of the promise because that's the only way he was born. Whereas Ishmael uh, was born by human beings saying, how can we make the promise of God come true instead of waiting for it? He was born by nature. It was, his birth wasn't surprising. So Paul has this allegory, and so Theodore has to deal with it. It's like, I'm opposed to allegory. I don't do allegory, but here are the apostles doing an allegory. So what he points out is the apostle does not destroy history, nor overturn deeds already done. These people, that is the allegorists, make everything the opposite way, wanting all the history of divine scripture to differ not from nightly dreams. Not even Adam, they say, is Adam, especially when it happens that they interpret concerning divine scripture spiritually. They want their foolish interpretation to be called spiritual. Nor do they say that paradise is paradise, nor that the serpent is a serpent, I have been wanting to tell them this, that by usurping history, they have come to have no history anymore. And this having been done, let them say whence they have the ability to assert who the first man was, or how he came to be disobedient, or how the sentence of death was introduced. And if indeed they have learned these things from the scriptures, necessarily that which is said by them to be allegory is obvious foolishness, because it's proven to be superfluous in every way. That what he's saying so far is um, he is pointing out that Paul is basing all these things on actual history and is not calling into question whether the history happened. Now, Origen didn't usually say the history didn't happen either, but he was wide open to the principle that it might not have happened that way, right? And so some of the interpreters who followed him were uh, freer with invoking that principle. And we notice the examples that Theodore uses here do have to do with the first couple chapters of Genesis, uh, where Origen was freer about saying this is purely an allegory. You know, like the waters that cover the earth at the beginning of, the, of chapter one, you know, the waters that cover the earth are unformed matter. You know, it's not actually water, it's unformed matter that God then supplies form for in a Platonic sort of understanding. So um, this is what Theodore especially objects to 
when allegory takes the place of history. And this kind of has become the classic difference between allegory and typology. Like typology is something that actually happened in history, and then it also has this application to the future, whereas allegory is um, maybe it didn't happen in history. It doesn't really matter. It's a figurative story to tell you something else. And then he says here, uh, if they have learned these things from the scriptures, that is, that Adam was the first man and that the, uh, Adam and Eve fell uh, to the serpent, then whatever they're saying by allegory, like, does it matter? It's just superfluous. And this is a problem we'll, we'll, that we'll get to talk about, about allegory. You know, does allegory add anything? But if this is true, and the things written do not retain a narrative of things actually done, but indicate some other thing that's deep and that ought to be understood or as spiritual as they want to say, and which they have discovered, obviously, because they are themselves spiritual folk, <laughs> from whence then have they received their understanding? How do they say these things, speaking as though they've been taught thus by the scripture? And in many places, the apostle is clear that he had employed, and I gave the Latin there, I'll explain why in a minute, that he had employed the history of the ancients as truth in all respects. And by this passage, as if from the deeds done and those things which were deduced in confession among the Jews, St. Paul attempts to prove his assertion that the things according to Christ would be shown to be greater than the things that are in the law, and that the righteousness that is with us would be seen to be more honorable than that which is in the law, which is the point he's making with the allegory of Hagar and Sarah, um, that the Jerusalem which is below is Israel that has rejected Christ in bondage with its children, and the church is the Jerusalem which is above. Um, the, the son of promise. So he says, um, this is Latin because this has survived in Latin. Interesting thing about Theodore's uh, commentary on the minor epistles of Paul, the way they survived, despite the fact that Theodore had been condemned, they survived in a Latin translation ascribed to Ambrose. <laughs> so modern scholars have been able to prove by comparing the Latin entire document to fragments we have that we know are Theodore, that this is actually a translation of Theodore. So you hear Ambrosiaster talked about sometimes. Ambrosiaster is a false Ambrose from the same document, basically, as this that, that survived Theodore. Theodore was one of the Ambrosiasters. Um, so uh, when it says that the Apostle Paul employed the history of the ancients, employed, I'm not happy with my translation there, um, it's he abused the history of the ancients. He misused the history of the ancients. And this is the word he uses, okay? Utor to use, abutor to abuse. Um, and this is the word he normally uses for like allegor allegorizers. You know, you're not using that, you're abusing it. But here he uses the word for St. Paul, and he doesn't mean that St. Paul is doing anything illegitimate, right? He says, uh, first, Paul is doing it, and he's doing it in such a way that he, that he still doesn't call into question the Old Testament record, whether it's true or not, but he still calls it to abuse it. Paul's taking it out of its normal sense and applying it in a weird way to something else. And, he, and he, that's perfectly okay if the apostle wants to do this, but it's not the natural meaning. This is the apostle being creative. So we get here to Theodore's Judaizing exegesis of the Old Testament. Um, he sort of falls off the other side of the horse. Theodore's very heavy restriction, McGuckin writes, on the use of the Old Testament for typological interconnections demonstrates his generic preference for reading the Hebrew Bible as a closed system that maintained a pre-Christian religious dispensation, superior to Hellenism, but destined to give way before the coming of the New Covenant. According to Leontius of, Byz of Byzantium, oops, uh, fifth and sixth century critic of Theodore, he disparaged the glory of the Holy Scriptures which are inspired by the Holy Ghost and he treated them in a low and degrading style, interpreting the Psalms in a Judaizing spirit and applying them not to Christ but to Hezekiah or Zerubbabel. So Theodore really wants to interpret the Old Testament on its own terms. I mean, he is dedicated to this in a way that no modern who's dedicated to this could surpass him, really. Um, well, okay, I guess he could ignore some of the things Theodore can't ignore. 
if he simply doesn't believe in the inspiration of Scripture. But nobody who believes in the inspiration of Scripture, I think, could be more dedicated to this project than Theodore was, trying to keep the Old Testament hermetically sealed as its own thing, and Israel as its own thing, and um, avoid all of these connections to the New Testament um, that the allegorizers just come up with hand over fist. Theodore recognized only four psalms as messianic. Psalm 2, that's why do the nations rage? And you are my son, today I have begotten you. Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, and you made him a little lower than the angels. Psalm 45, my heart overflows with a pleasing theme. And your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And then Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, which Jesus himself applies to himself, right, in the New Testament. What about Psalm 22? What's that? What about Psalm 22? We're we're about to deal with that, yeah. (laughs) Um, So what what do these four have in common? References in the New Testament. Father speaking. References in the New Testament. We can make it even more narrow than that. They're all cited as proof of Christ's divinity in Hebrews chapter 1. Yeah. So these he can't get around. Like the New Testament itself makes the connection so tight that he's like, okay, those are messianic psalms. <laughs> He had an interesting theory about the book of Psalms. Blessed David, remember, as I said before, had clearly addressed in the Psalms all the vicissitudes that would befall the people. But silence prevailed during the intervening time for the reason he'd foretold everything satisfactorily. The time came, however, for the ten tribes to begin their suffering. What had long been foretold by blessed David about the disasters that would befall the people, divine grace communicated to the prophets when the events were close at hand. Okay, I think I left something out of that quote that would have made it make more sense. But this is from one of his commentaries on the minor prophets. He's saying the minor prophets, um, they pick up again things that David prophesied in the Psalms because now they're about to happen. Like for centuries, nobody has addressed these things, but now they're about to happen, and so God sends the prophets, the minor prophets, to say, all right, Israel, this is about to happen to you. He's, his, his idea of the Psalms was that the whole book was written by David. And this is an idea he shared with, uh, with Augustine and with, uh, I, don't know, I don't know about Origen, but it was a widespread idea in, in the early church that David wrote the entire book of Psalms. Um, so then, what do you do with some of the inscriptions? Um, this is going to be the, the second part of the presentation. What do, you, what do you do with some of the Psalm inscriptions that say that this was one of the psalms of the sons of Korah, right? Or that this psalm happened, um, this was a psalm of Solomon, or this was a psalm of Moses. Um, Yeah, or Asaph, or this is a psalm that happened when, you know, something that didn't happen in David's life happened. He said, well, since David was a prophet, David, um, in, in, in in those instances, he put himself into that character from the future and spoke as if he were that character in the future and um, spoke about a future time and wove that into his psalm. And so the psalms he actually read as uh, prophetic of three major deliverances of Egypt, or uh, three major deliverances of Israel, not the one from Egypt because the book of Psalms was composed after that had already happened, but the deliverance from the Assyrians under Hezekiah uh, when the angel of the Lord struck dead that huge Assyrian army that was about to flatten Jerusalem the way they had already taken the northern tribes away. The return from Babylon after the captivity, and then the success of Israel in defending their religion and their state against the uh, Macedonians and the, Maccabe- and the Maccabean revolt. So he said these three things, and the last one being even later than the you know, Old Testament, unless you're going by the Septuagint, the Septuagintal Old Testament, and including the intertestamental books, that is the whole history of Israel basically comprehended in the Psalms already. And um, 
It's an interesting idea. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So you already asked this. What about Psalm 22? Um, like, that's not, that's not a messianic psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, those who want this psalm to be in the persona of the Lord, so in the persona of, that's how he talks about it when David puts himself in the character of a person from the future. David, David is saying it, but he's saying it in the persona of Hezekiah, or he's saying it in the persona of Jesus, people claim here, but they, in this place, run into no small rashness. How indeed can it be accepted that the Lord said this about himself? Because remember, it's got to be the whole psalm. If David is speaking in persona of Christ, it's got to be the whole psalm. How can the Lord say he is far from my salvation and the rest? Um, you know, the, part of that psalm seems to be the lament of a sinner. And so he says, no, that can't apply to Jesus. Indeed, it is established that placed on the cross at the time of his passion, he said, my God, my God, look on me and the rest. But this saying does not in any way indicate that this psalm pertains to him. <laughs> Nor indeed did Jesus use this testimony as if something said previously through prophecy was then being fulfilled by events. He said it because he had received suffering, beatings, blows, nails, and a gibbet. Consequently, he made use of this cry, which is as fitting that all the pious should utter when they suffer something of this sort. Jesus was making a literary illusion. <laughs> one, one of many who uh, yeah. suffers in such a way. Right. Um, like any, any uh, righteous man suffering unjustly could say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he'd be doing the same thing Jesus was doing there. Well, not exactly the same thing. Um, you know, I think, I think Theodore would recognize that Jesus is saying this in a more absolute way than anybody else can, right? I, and that's one of the interesting things about this. Um, you know, I think Theodore is stretching to a ridiculous extent when he denies that it's a messianic psalm. But I, you still get something good out of it, right? That Jesus actually is quoting a psalm. Like, even if the psalm was written specifically about him, Jesus still makes a decision to quote it. You know, why is he quoting it? What's he teaching us when he quotes it? And I think one of the things he's teaching us is, yeah, David said this, but you could answer, David, <laughs> David, you're a sinner. <laughs> you know, this is happening because you're a sinner. When Jesus says that he's unanswerable, my God, my God, why are you forsaken me? There is no answer to that at all. There's no, justice has no answer to that. And then you realize, well, whoever it was about originally, it really belongs to Jesus. Yes? I just did an observation. It sounds like when you box yourself into a certain... He, was boxed, he had boxed himself in as far as his thinking of the Old Testament was a closed... Yeah. And when you box in, we box yourself. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think with, uh, with Origen to an extent, but with Theodore more, because Origen is, 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 Origen is dedicated to a theory that allows him so much freedom. And Theodore is dedicated to a theory that's, that tries to restrict the freedom. Um, so, so it's more obvious with Theodore that, yeah, he's um, over-dedicated to a theory. Like a theory that he has to make all kinds of exceptions to, but he's still not willing to let go. Okay, so examples of some of that, what I said that he does with the Psalms, um, and David prophesying the future of Israel. He says that Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, which both open the fool says in his heart, there is no God. He says that these are Psalms, and they're not by any means the old ones. There's a lot of Psalms, he says, are about Hezekiah and the deliverance from the Assyrians. These are some of them. And, and he identifies the fool who says in his heart, there is no God, as being the Rabshaka, who on that scene speaks on behalf of the Assyrian king, and Hezekiah, and says, you're a fool. You're a fool to resist us. Do you think your God will save you? He says, the gods in this place, and the gods in that place, and the gods in this other place, none of them save them. None of them save their people against us. Your God's not going to save you either. And so this is seen as equivalent as saying the original God. The fool is satisfied by the original God. The Rabshakeh is the fool. 
and that's part of the evidence that these software adopts the attack or the unsuccessful siege of the Assyrians in the days of Hezekiah. Um, the Babylonians after the captivity, this is interesting, like one of the examples would be Psalm 127, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those in the, we were like those who dream. Right? It's a beautiful song. It, it is about the return, right? Uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't contest him on this. It is about the return from Babylon. It's obviously about the return from Babylon. Um, but in this case, he has, he's saying that it was predicted, like long before the captivity even started. David prophesied in the person of these people who are returning from Babylon and uh, are overjoyed to be back. So that's interesting. Like he's right. There actually are some songs that are about the captivity. Um, it's just. Uh, a strange tradition that I'm not sure where it comes from that David must be prophesying every second. And the song can't be by somebody from that actual time period. And then the Maccabean revolt. Like this is an example of where you where you really start to see um, what later generations would see as verging on Judaism. The zeal of your house has consumed me. Like who would you who would you apply that to? <laughs> Beautiful at the Jesus, right? I mean, because when he finds the temple, uh, at least one gospel explicitly says his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house has consumed me. But here's what Theodore does with it. Seeing your house thus insulted and an altar to the name of Zeus standing in it, and sacrifices being carried out for the worship of idols, being seized by zeal and anger and not bearing to look, I withdrew. And this is especially suited to Matthias who actually killed the one who was ordering, along with the one who was sacrificed. That's Mattathias, father of Judas Maccabees, who started the Maccabean revolt. That's who that's about. David is prophesying in the persona of Mattathias, the zeal for your house has consumed you. So, he might, I mean, what he must say about the disciples when they, when they apply it to Jesus is it's another literary illusion. Yes? Is that what Berkeley quoted? I'm trying to remember. It is directly quoted, yeah. Um, but it says the disciples remember that it was said, as you know, for your house you're consumed. So maybe you can use a lot. It doesn't actually say that it was said about Jesus. You know, they're just making an application. And then uh, another verse in this same psalm they have given gall for my food, and in my thirst they have watered me with vinegar. So that sounds like Jesus on the cross, right? The evangelist made use of this testimony when he spoke about the passion of the Lord, which indeed he sets forth as proof of Jewish impiety. It was not published in the time, or maybe he means about the time of the Lord's passion, but was predicted a very long time before by the divine scriptures. Therefore, it is proven to have been adapted more to similar things than to the personal affairs of specific individuals. I'm not sure how he thinks he's proven it, but he certainly asserting that this is not a prophecy of Jesus on the cross, but rather, later on, people saw the connection and made the, and made the, the connection. The end of Old Testament prophecy, then, is really a fascinating feature of Theodore. When those of the company of Judas Maccabeus championed the divine law, and on its behalf declared war on the Macedonian kings, a kind of massive reform happened to the whole race. In fact, in the seat of divine grace, the Maccabees fought the kings, punished their depraved supporters, that is, Jews who had decided to pagans, and brought the whole nation to a state of stability and good order, so that the divine laws were enforced amongst them. All lawlessness previously enforced was expelled from them, and the priesthood performed appropriately all the liturgy required of them. Now basically he says Israel was terrible all throughout the Old Testament, but God was gradually reforming them. God was gradually bringing them to a place where they would become righteous and, and ready to recognize Jesus, whom he was going to send. Israel had to be ready before he would send Jesus so that the church could originally take root in Israel, so that the first people who believed in Jesus would be Jews, people who were familiar with how he was fulfilling the prophecies. The church would take root there and then spread to the nations. And that's, that's one of the best things about theater right there, I think, is that general thesis. Um, 
about what God is doing, training Israel to recognize the Christ. Uh, but in the process of this, he comes to this conclusion that at the end of the Old Testament, like after the Maccabees, after the last thing that he can find prophesied, explicitly prophesied in the prophets, um, that must have, they must have arrived at that point. Uh, Israel must have been a perfect righteous state at that point and no longer falling into the idolatry that they had fallen into countless times before. So, just a quick question. Yes. Well, well, who was the real precursor? You may have mentioned that, but I missed this. How did he come up with this solid set of hermeneutics to separate yeah. the Old Testaments the way he does? Theodore of Tarsus came before. The De um, yeah, but we, we don't. We, we, we actually do have his commentary in the Psalms, so we're able to make some connections. But Theodore, Theodore varies from him um, significantly on some points. Like, um, <coughs> The, there's obviously a lot of Jewish influence on theater. Like, the idea that the nation was perfected after the time of the Maccabees, does that sound like anything that could have come from anybody other than the Jews themselves? Right? Like, that was that was the perfect time my nation became perfectly uh, um, beholden to the law of God. We, the Pharisees, are just trying to maintain this uh, legacy of faithfulness to God's law. Um, I think a lot of this stuff he was getting from Jewish interpreters. Or maybe the other the tradition before it had gotten from Jewish interpreters. It's interesting. Um, John Chrysostom, when he was in Antioch, he preached a series of sermons against the Jews. Or actually, more, more accurately, against Judaizing Christians. And this is in, in a famous series of sermons, and in our day, a little bit of an infamous famous uh, series of sermons because of the harsh language he uses uh, to condemn the Jews of his time in order to warn the Christians in Antioch, don't go to the synagogue. You know, don't go with your Jewish friend at a Passover or something, whatever, at the synagogue. That's the synagogue of Satan. That is not where you will learn the truth. That is where they deny Jesus. And um, so... There was obviously in the fourth century, in the late fourth century, a very active Jewish community in Antioch that um, that you had to actually tell the Christians, no, they're not the same thing as us. And so this might be like as that, that's that's kind of a negative proof of the existence of that community. Theodore's interpretation might be uh, sort of a positive proof of the existence of that community. Actual influence, you know, that the. Uh, Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament it had with the Antiochene school. It's almost like putting up walls of safety to protect yourself from the false Judaizing <coughs> mindset, right, of, of the Old Testament or the synagogue or, or whatever. It's almost separating it, setting it aside, everything rectilinear. Well, it's, it's drawing a line in a different place. Because uh, Theodore, when he gets to the, like, Psalm 45 is interesting, that's one of the ones he accepts as messianic, and therefore he's got to actually fight with the translate, with the interpretation he would normally be using. Right, and so he actually argues expressly against the Jews and their interpretation of Psalm 45. He says, no, look, it doesn't apply to Zerubbabel, it can't for this reason and that reason, it applies to Jesus. So I think that the, the, the very tradition he's fighting against in Psalm 45, when he says this is a messianic psalm, is the same tradition he's basically adopting as true in all the rest of his interpretation. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, I don't think this is imagination that the later, the later uh, generations de detected some undue Jewish influence in his interpretation. From the commentary on Zephaniah, he is paraphrasing a passage uh, Zephaniah 3, 8, 9. I, this is God speaking, shall admit that is allowed to approach many kings and viceroys along with their armies moving on Jerusalem so as to make clear my care for you through the events themselves. On the one hand, and on the other, to pour out extreme wrath on them because of their enormous crime against my own people. Now he is referring to those in Gog's company, Gog and Magog, this is, who made their attack on them after their return, and whom he destroyed despite their innumerable forces. Now, how did Theodore know who Gog and Magog were? Nobody knows who Gog and Magog were, right? Like Gog and Magog, there's all kinds of different theories about that, and 
you know, dispensationalists will say that it's, you know, it's, the, the, it's Russia or whatever coming down to crush the state of Israel in the, in the last times, which are still future to us. Theodore asserts that this was an attack that happened when the, when the um, tribes came back from the Babylonian captivity. This huge Scythian attack came from the north, and God repelled it for them. The problem is there's no record of this in the Old Testament or in secular history. Like, Theodore just asserts this. Um, and then he goes further with the assertion, a general astonishment will seize all people everywhere at the novelty of what happens, in that those settled in different places and behaving as different nations will use one language as it were, and with one accord confess the God of the Israelites to be God, and all established under one yoke, as it were, they will believe service under him to be a blessed thing, on the basis of what you are due to be granted by you, Israel. So this is how he treats all of the prophetic passages that talk about the Gentiles coming and worshiping at Jerusalem, right? You know, um, a multitude of camels shall cover you. Uh, the, uh, the, the Gentiles coming to pay homage in Jerusalem. There are multiple passages like this in the Minor Prophets. And um, everybody else in the early church takes this to be prophecy of the church. The Gentiles will come into Israel. Right? The Gentiles will believe in the God of Israel through Jesus Christ, and that fulfills this prophecy. And um, you know, some of these prophecies are predictions of the exiles returning. The exiles are going to return to the land, and they're going to bring with them the Gentiles. Well, that's you know, Jews and Gentiles from all over the place believing in the God of Israel for the first time because the church is spread to all the world. But he doesn't interpret it that way. So he has to assert that there was this Pax Judaica <laughs> there was this Pax Judaica at the end of the Old Testament where um, it was very common for the Gentile nations to uh, actually worship at Jerusalem and, and recognize the God of Israel. What happened to them? I don't know. <laughs> um, but there's one passage in Josephus that says, like, after, after the events of the book of Esther, when... Um, when the king ended up surprised siding with the Jews and the Jews slaughtered all the people who were planning to slaughter them, um, Josephus says that the great fear of the Jews went out throughout the land and some Gentiles went to the extent of accepting circumcision out of fear for the Jews, out of fear of the Jews. And so Josephus takes that, like that's his one secular history proof of this Pax Judaica, like that this happened generally everywhere. Um, so, you know, it's like dispensationalists say, they say, well, it must not have happened yet. Right? This, all this, how do we know there's going to have to be Israel after the flesh still being dealt with as God's special people sometime in the future after the church is raptured? How do we know that? Well, we've got all these prophecies in the Old Testament that haven't come true yet. And the classic Christian answer to that is no, all those prophecies came true in the church. But today's dispensationalists say, no, that's giving Israel a short shrift. It didn't come true in the church. It must not have happened yet. Theodore just says, it did happen. It's a Josephus. Go read it. <laughs> okay, so I think this is basically what I just said. I just want to, I love this quote at the end. Robert Hill and translating the Meyer Prophet's commentaries and did a lot of other Antiochian stuff recently. He says, in Theodore's, in Theodore's view, to historic, that is the historical sense or historical interpretation, required an insistence on historicity, not evidence of it. <laughs> so Old Testament, New Testament, this is this is the Theodore diagram. Um, a uh, Closed system. Old Testament is a closed system, New Testament is a closed system. We try to keep it that way as much as possible. But realistically speaking, every once in a while a prophecy escapes. <laughs> um, like most of what the prophets say, it's got horizon of the Old Testament. But they can't get any further into the future than the facts you day. Um, but the New Testament uh, doesn't let him be consistent with this. Every once in a while, it actually is a messianic song. And um, he also ends up allowing for some double fulfillment sometimes. So, like this, 
first Sunday of Advent, right? Rejoice exceedingly, daughter Zion, proclaim, daughter Jerusalem, lo, your king comes to you, righteous and saving, humble and riding on a beast with burden and colt. I shall wipe out chariots from Ephraim and a horse from Jerusalem, and a battle bow will be destroyed, a multitude and peace from nations. He says, you find many such statements that were expressed hyperbolically in the first place, not doing justice to the precise reality of the meaning, but which are found to contain in it, in reference to Christ, or, or a reference to Christ the Lord, of such a kind as this one too. While he referred to Zerubbabel, like this prophecy is really about Zerubbabel, uh, the leader of the Jews when they came back from captivity in Babylon, by right of succession to David, by God's will, the contents were seen to contain their irrefutable reality, he could speak more clearly here, in the case of Christ the Lord. So this is a prophecy originally about Zerubbabel, but, I mean, really, it's kind of overdone for Zerubbabel. It really fits Christ better. You know, because after Zerubbabel comes back, like, it's not really true that all the chariots are wiped out from Ephraim and there are no more war horses in Jerusalem and no more battle bows. It's like, they got attacked by Gog and Magog shortly after, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, they can't really apply. It actually applies to Jesus better than it applies to Jerobo. But he still has to say it was prophesied about Jerobo. How does that work? We don't know. It's it, one of those escapes. <laughs> um, yeah, to the former, that is to Zerubbabel, belongs the brief punishment of the nation and the paltry saving of his own people. The true expression emerged, however, in Christ the Lord, in whom there is the real possibility for lasting and enduring joy. In this case, then, there's a reference to Zerubbabel when the expression is assessed by that to which the death immediately refers, whereas in the Gospels, the sense has moved on to Christ the Lord. So he does end up and create some double for uh, This is another example. Before the day of the Lord, the land will be troubled and heaven shaken, the sun and moon will be darkened, and the stars will lose their light. Theodore says Joel's talking about the destruction that the Assyrians and the Babylonians are going to wreak on Israel and Judah. Um, but he, he again says that he's speaking by hyperbole. Um, uh, when he starts to talk about the stars and the moon being dark, and like that's just, well, if you're going to suffer so much, it's going to seem to you that the moon is dark and that the stars are falling. But that is literally actually going to happen at the end of the world, so it applies there better than it applies here, even though it's really a prophecy about the woes of Israel in the Old Testament. Um, everything turned out in reality in the time of Christ the Lord. The sun was actually darkened and the moon with it. Great portents occurred in heaven and many on earth. Uh, yeah, right, even before the end of the world, this happened, the darkness on the cross. The saving blood of Christ the Lord appeared, as well as fire, in keeping with the particular action of the Spirit's visit, preceded by clouds of smoke, that fire would be the fire of the day of Pentecost, to, success by, to suggest by way of proof the punishment that the Greek on those guilty of the crucifixion. So Peter actually quotes this prophecy, right? Peter, in the Pentecost reading, quotes that prophecy from Joel and says, this is being fulfilled before you right now. So again, Theodore is forced by the New Testament to say, well, okay, it was originally about this, but it works better for this in the New Testament. So I guess that wasn't my accident. <laughs> so would Theodore conclude that uh, the crucifixion was something that was leaked over from Genesis 3.15? Good question. I don't know if I, I don't know if we have that fragment in Genesis. I mean, I think, I think he could see, he could see it as a historical, like God makes a promise and then that promise is fulfilled. The promise of his seed. Paul says explicitly in Galatians that Jesus is the seed. So I think, you know, he might move back into it, but he would have to end up there. Yeah. If you will not have bearing my soul to Hades, nor will your holy one see corruption. I mean, Peter applies that explicitly to Christ in the book of Acts. And so he says, originally it's about Israel, how Israel will not be abandoned to Hades, but then, well, okay. In Acts, 
Peter made use of the last part of this psalm so that it said properly of the Lord. Properly, that is, not improperly. He doesn't say it's abused to be about the Lord. This testimony has not been usurped by the apostle but returned to its cause, for clearly it had been predicted by the prophet, and so fittingly it is claimed for the person of the Lord, for previously it had been said in likeness and figure. So another example, like probably this would keep happening if you kept bringing up, well, what about this from the New Testament? What about this from the New Testament? His, his approach seems to be nothing is about the New Testament except explicitly what the apostles say is about the New Testament. And I think that's basically the hermeneutic that the historical grammatical people have in our day. You know, pe people who try to stay as far away from allegorical interpretation as they possibly can, but they have to say, well, Peter did say that. <laughs> Peter did say it was fulfilled here, but I'm not going one inch further than what is explicitly used by the apostles in this way. So there, there's uh, on the bottom, there's one escaping. <laughs> on the top, that's an actual like direct rectilinear prophecy. And on the bottom, that's one of these re things that re get reapplied in a better way. So... I want to link this because um, I think the link is totally organic. Um, Theodore has, a, uh, as a governing principle in his theology, the, the theology, the doctrine of the two ages. That is, um, the world happens in two ages. God makes a mortal world capable of falling into sin. He knows it's going to fall into sin, so he provides things in advance um, like... Uh, procreation so that the, the men who are going to die don't all die. Um, he creates this world and then he sends Christ to create a new world. And um, those are the two worlds. And one corresponds to the Old Testament and the other corresponds to the New Testament. And I think this is one reason besides his opposition to origin. This is the other reason, the positive reason why he tries to keep the Old Testament hermetically sealed. Because that is, that is the old world, and the New Testament is about the new world, uh, the new age. How Christ comes and everything changes. And um, the way he talks, and this is one of the things that makes him really good, actually, in, in the book of Galatians. Uh, the way he talks about the Christian life, he talks about it as if it doesn't even happen in the present. Like, it, it, he talks about it as if it happens in the future. Like, all the things that Christians ought to do, all Christian morality comes down not to thus says the law, but what will it be like in the resurrection? If I were living the life of the resurrection right now, what would I do? Because that's what's been promised to me. What's been promised to me is a life where I will be incorruptible, where I will never fall into sin again. I'm never even going to be tempted. I'm going to be like Jesus. Um... Christian morality is living in the future now. Um, and yeah, you know, you, you, you can look at the law and the thou shalt not, and that can curb you if all else fails, but the real New Testament motivation is I'm going to be, re I'm going to be raised one day, and what will I be like then? I'm, I want to be that now. So, like, we're, the, our status really right now is very technically in Theodore, like, we're between two worlds. Um, like in our flesh, we're still the old world, but through baptism, we are the new world. And this is actually a really good thing and uh, element of Theodore's theology that I found very useful in my own understanding and ex you know, ability to explain things about the Christian faith. And I think that that's one reason why he tries to keep the Old Testament so locked up, because he's doing an overlay there. Yes? Is there a significance to the crucifixion touching the old age, or that's just a graphic? <laughs> that's just a graphic. <laughs> that is just, that just happened. Sometimes things just happen. I do not claim Holy Spirit authorship for my uh, presentation, and therefore it cannot, it cannot be the secret plan of God, or it could be, but I wouldn't know. <laughs> All right, so that's, I'm done with that. Uh, we have like one minute for questions before noon. 
And next, a little more about Theodore, as far as the, you know, because you, you seem to like and can agree with him in much of his uh, biblical hermeneutics for the New Testament, <coughs> about Galatians. Uh, and can you add a little <coughs> distinction on, in regards to any antinomianism in him, or what's his law gospel dialect? Where, where, where is he? His only problem in Galatians is he gets to the end and says, we can't preach this. <laughs> right? Because there's nothing to get done. Right. He has a reason behind that because he doesn't, well, he, he's thinking that the law still must guide morality rather than simply the gospel changing and creating a spontaneity of faith. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, the law still tells you what is true and what is right. Right, and if you're setting aside the law and saying, well, I'm going to go ahead and do that, then you're wrong. Um, but the enlightened reason to, obey, to, to be good is to be like Jesus is going to make you. Um, you know, basically, if, if somebody has to point out to the law and say, look, Jesus is not going to make you like that. You know, Jesus is not going to make you homosexual in the, in the resurrection. Well, how do you know? Well, look, they're in the law. It's, it's evil. It's wrong, you know, and... But if, you've, but if you've got to get to that point where you're pointing to the law, then you've already missed the boat on what Christian morality is supposed to be. Well, you know, sometimes we're going to miss the boat. I, I don't, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a perfectionist. And sometimes he gets tarred with the Pelagian brush because of the whole Julian of Eclanum connection. Um, but he wasn't, a, I mean, he wasn't a perfectionist. He straight out said it's impossible to live in the flesh without sinning. So we are going to need the law sometimes, but that's, you know, that's our weakness. <laughs>